It was around 1990s that biotechnology was ushered in India and stimulated a renewed interest in the mysteries of cellular life with far-reaching progress that you witness today. We cells are the basic units of life in the plant and animal world, including you humans too. Each cell in your body has a specific characteristic, dictating its interactions with other cells, molecules and microorganisms and the surrounding tissues. Plants and animals are composed of trillions of microscopic cells of different types. And I have the honor of having been the first to be observed as a cell by Robert Hooke in 1665, which I should say made visible for the first time our hitherto unexplored microscopic world. To understand the functioning of any living body, it is important to study the nuances of how the various components of biological systems operate at the minutest molecular level. Learning about the nuts and bolts of the cellular machinery provides invaluable insight into how a normal healthy body functions and what abnormalities at the tiniest level lead to various diseases. And that is the basic research that has been carried out with the consistent support of different in-house facilities of the institution over the last 30 years. It was in 1986 that the promising new possibilities envisaged by biotechnology led to the establishment of a modest tissue culture facility within the zoology department of the University of Pune which has metamorphosed over the last three decades into the large, multidisciplinary National Center for Cell Science. Ever since I first peered through a microscope, I wondered, how do these tiny little cells organize themselves into a walking, talking, thinking human being? This question led me to pursue a career in this exciting field of biology. I am from a small town and I feel lucky to have been selected as a PhD student here at NCCS in the midst of the Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. And now, I would like to fully explore the interconnected web of the fascinating research that is being conducted in the labs here before choosing my area of focus. Way back in the 17th century, it was the technology of polished glass lenses that set the pace of microbiological discoveries. Rapid improvements in optical design, from magnifying lenses to simple and compound microscopes, and further to more sophisticated instruments, eventually helped advance the discipline of cell science to present times. And Wow! What you see now is of unbelievable magnitude. This confocal scanning microscope uses laser to illuminate single planes of tissues so that one can visualize the sections of sub-micron resolution. 
thousands of times more magnified than Hooke's discovery over 300 years ago. Today we know that the human body is made up of trillions of cells. And guess what? Biologists have discovered around 200 different types of cells. Over the years, research has revealed that each cell is designed to form a particular organ that carries out a specific vital function. And all of them put together makes for a complex interdependent system, a well-oiled machine in perfect working condition called a healthy human being. Life begins with a single cell and it is remarkable that the information to form an entire organism is present in that very cell. Soon after fertilization, the single-celled embryo undergoes a series of divisions until it finally forms a structure of around 16 to 32 cells called the blastocyst, where we can find a very special type of cell called the embryonic stem cell. So embryonic stem cells are actually derived from the early embryo. And these cells have the capability of giving rise to all the cell types in the body. For example, muscle cells, neurons and epithelial cells. We use these cells to study how tissues, organs and organisms develop. We are also studying the cell biological properties of these cells in order to develop better cell-based therapies that can be used in regenerative medicine. Having visited some of the laboratories on campus, now I understand how over the years NCCS researchers have investigated various aspects of stem cell biology such as studying the movement of molecules within cells and how it dictates the differentiation of stem cells into diverse types of cells using stem cells to model neurodevelopmental disorders, studying the mechanism that regulates blood stem cell fate, standardizing the use of stem cells in bone remodeling, understanding stem cell differentiation, developing cryopreservation protocols for hematopoietic and mesenchymal stem cells, and the generation of induced pluripotent stem cells. Together, the research stemming from these groups aims to understand the process of early mammalian development and the generation of specific systems such as the nervous system, the hematopoietic system, etc. I wonder how it all started right here in the university campus. I got an opportunity to work in Nobel Institute for Medical Cell Research and Genetics in Sweden with Professor Kasperson. And I could do a lot of things there, a lot of things. Then I decided on return I would develop an organization wherein all scientists will get all the facilities. And a unit was established, temporary unit, by ICMR to start with in the Department of Zoology. The activity expanded to such an extent that we needed more space. So we purchased two buildings named Jitnyasa and Jopasna, where we could shift all these and carry out work. Once the facilities were set up, it was time to start the research projects. The first project that I started at NFATCC was to try to use cell lines as an alternative for animals in biomedical research. And this was possible only because NFATCC had a full range of cell lines, right from mosquito to man, and also the centralized facilities for washing, packing, and sterilization, which was a luxury at that time. The basic theme was regeneration, organ preservation, organ banking, and this has led to the entire research area in my field. Dr. Hay head of ATCC cell culture visited us and knowing our capacity and our facilities, he recognized that 
as a comprehensive international cell repository. From what I realize, the founding director was very conscious of the social responsibilities of science right from the very inception of the institute. He encouraged application-driven translational research, set high standards for cell culture methodologies and initiated regular hands-on training program for cell culture propagation. Eight years later, Dr. G.C. Mishra took over the reins of the fledgling organization, which was poised for incremental growth in every possible way. Shifting from the utilitarian go-through facility to a specifically designed spacious campus. In 1995, the institute was called as ANFATCC. In order to attract qualified, competent scientists, that institute should be named as National Center for Cell Science. I went abroad, USA, met 110 people, and could bring, as a reverse migration, eight qualified, highly trained scientists. I equipped the institute with state-of-art equipments, facilitated the process of requiring animals and reagents, give them freedom, and it clicked in a very short time. NCCS started being recognized as one of the best institutions in this country. There were manifold expansions all around. Specialized Animal House, Cell Culture Repository, Technological Leap in Essential Equipment, Change of Focus towards Innovation through Basic Research, and heralding all this, reflecting a renewed vigor, the change of nameplate to the National Center for Cell Science. Research at NCCS also focuses on studying how <laughs> pathogens such as the influenza virus attack the human body. So the human body has exquisite defense mechanism which help us to protect from pathogens such as influenza viruses or other viruses. But what happened during course of evolution, viruses have developed strategies that can help them to evade this immune response. By gaining insights into the strategies that pathogens adopt to evade and overcome the body's immune system, research groups here aspire to help develop better drugs against pathogens. Scientists at NCCS are conducting research to understand the working of the immune systems in healthy as well as affected individuals. In addition, investigations are also geared towards learning how and why the immune system sometimes turns against itself, resulting in autoimmune diseases. 20th century witnessed a remarkable growth in almost all the branches of science. And molecular biology was no exception. In the 1950s, Sir Francis Crick postulated the central dogma of molecular biology. This stated that DNA was an information storage molecule capable of replicating itself and transmitting information. This information has to be read in order to put together the amino acids in a specific sequence to ultimately synthesize every distinct protein through an intermediate step of another molecule called RNA. This flow of information is regulated at multiple stages to control the production of certain specific proteins at any given time in response to different stimuli such as a cell being attacked by a pathogen, 
a stem cell differentiating into a particular cell type or a cell simply undergoing division. Any deviation from this precisely controlled system causes serious molecular upheaval resulting in major diseases such as diabetes, autoimmune diseases and even cancer. Cancer claims among the largest number of victims every year worldwide. And NCCS researchers have put in considerable efforts into tackling this menace since the early days. The major focus of research here is to understand the alterations in the gene regulatory networks in different types of cancers affecting vital organs such as lung, brain, ovary and breast. The NCCS research initiative specifically has been in the discovery of cancer stem cells which contribute to tumor heterogeneity in a tumor actually that makes it a very difficult proposition to treat. Other initiatives have also been in the discovery of long non-coding RNAs as well as in elucidation of the cellular signaling networks and crosstalk which are important in understanding oncogenesis. I understand that non-coding RNAs are RNAs that do not code for proteins. So then what else can they do? The RNA pair that we discovered in this lab was termed as GINR, it is genomic instability inducing RNA and its antisense counterpart. By performing a lot of in vivo and in vitro experiments, we were able to kind of prove that this RNA pair was responsible in maintaining cellular homeostasis and a disturbance in the levels was responsible for cancer. Other research groups here also aim at understanding the relationship between different diseases and metabolic disorders like cancer, diabetes and obesity. In 2011, Dr. Shekhar Mande took over the mantle of this prestigious organization considered amongst the top high-profile life science research institutes in India. With him, an era of multidisciplinary collaborations for fast and effective deliverables in modern biology was initiated. A new wave of innovative approaches to address the existing problems has taken root. Today, much of the pioneering investigative work has found fruition and is poised for fresh collaborations with clinicians to explore possibilities for translating the promising scientific breakthroughs into tangible benefits for patients. All this is so very fascinating and complex. It will be interesting to find out what sort of instruments are required to carry out these highly complicated experiments. Wow! Look at that! NCCS researchers are really fortunate to have the latest state-of-the-art equipment to study almost every minute aspect of cells in-house without having to step out of the campus. The sequencing facility helps read and count the presence of specific DNA and RNA sequences in a sample. This versatile machine can also be used to identify any changes or mutations in the sequence of DNA. The proteomics facility is equipped with advanced instruments like mass spectrometers with the ability to analyze all the proteins and metabolites present in any specifically chosen cell or tissue. NCCS also has a number of the latest technologically advanced microscopes like this confocal laser scanning microscope. Using fluorescent markers, researchers can now study the movement and localization of specific molecules and organelles with extraordinary resolution in real time. The flow cytometry facility at NCCS 
has a number of high-end cell sorters and analyzers. These machines help detect the presence of specific proteins in a single cell and can even sort out individual cells based on the level of a particular protein. Now I realize how all these instruments are vital for NCCS researchers to investigate the basic biology and physiology of cells, which could eventually lead to innovative therapies against various diseases, such as infections by Leishmania. So that's the kind of effort that we have been doing, going deeper into the areas of modern cell biology, strengthening the areas uh, that we were already in, we had our presence in, for example, cancer biology and so on and so forth. Uh, adding certain new areas which we thought is a more futuristic way of looking at cell biology. Uh, connecting to the society and connecting to industry. One of the newer research areas at NCCS involves the study of macromolecular structures. The major research activity of this group is focused on three cellular processes namely host pathogen interactions, nuclear cytoplasmic transport and neuronal transmission. Such research is important to understand how the structure of specific proteins contribute towards their exact function. Proteins are the workhorses of any cellular function and they are like these nano machines that carry out various steps of these uh, cellular processes and to obtain high resolution information, structural information into functions of these proteins, structural biologists around the world study them in great details by using techniques like X-ray diffraction or single particle cryo-electron microscopy. These insights can lead to precisely targeting them for therapeutic interventions or drug discovery. Researchers here utilize X-ray radiation to determine extremely high-resolution structures of protein crystals, revealing angstrom-level details, which can you imagine are a hundred millionth of a millimeter. Fruit flies! I wonder what sort of research goes on in here. Understanding how memories are formed is a question that has intrigued humans for thousands of years. At NCCS, the fruit fly is used as a model organism to study how individuals form memories. Contrasting tastes, smells or even courtship behavior are a stimuli for studying the molecular basis of sensorial memory formation. The fruit fly, believe it or not, is remarkably similar to us human beings. And so is a versatile system for study. We hope that our research will eventually lead to a deeper understanding of how our brains work and also to therapeutic approaches of treating neurodegenerative disorders. It is fascinating that the human body, which has tens of trillions of cells, is inhabited by many more microbial cells, which constitute the human microbiome. It is now realized that these minuscule microorganisms influence almost all aspects of human life, moods, food habits, and even the propensity towards specific diseases. Realizing the seminal importance of research in this area, the National Center for Microbial Resource, NCMR, at NCCS, is now geared to initiate an unprecedented Pan-India project on the Indian human microbiome. The broad charter of NCMR is to authenticate, characterize, and preserve microbial resources from diverse sources. The extensive collection of microorganisms at NCMR makes it the largest individual culture collection in the world. It has been recognized as an International Depository Authority, IDA, 
for the deposition of patent microorganisms. I am on my way to meet Dr. Gopal Kundu, who has recently taken over the responsibilities of NCCS as the director in charge. As you know, NCCS conducts several academic and training programs for students, for technicians, technical officers. The National Center for Cell Science has definitely come a long way since the early days of 1986. Expertise honed attract many close collaborations with the industry. It has a specifically designed rigorous biotechnology coursework for PhD students. NCCS has also hosted several Nobel laureates to interact with students and give public lectures. Additionally, outreach programs are routinely conducted to inculcate scientific temper through science popularization. The annual sports and cultural events are very popular and stimulating. Taking care of the physical and mental well-being of the students, staff and faculty. Today, NCCS has a spacious and green campus with comfortable hostels, faculty housing, guest house, director's bungalow and other administrative support facilities necessary for the smooth running of any such large organization. Many faculty members of NCCS have been elected fellows of national and international science academies. NCCS scientists have made significant contributions and gained recognition through several awards and prestigious honors, such as the Padma Shri Award, the Shanti Swaroop Patnagar Award, the National Bioscience Award, the J.C. Bose National Fellowship, the National Woman Bioscientist Award, the Wellcome Trust Fellowship, and many others. Under the leadership of Dr. Ullas Wag, Dr. Gyan Chandra Mishra, Dr. Shekhar Bande, and Dr. Gopal Kundu, NCCS has grown exponentially and aspires to take cell biology research to greater heights. The relentless quest of over three decades now finds a new vision, a new horizon, and fresh energy to leap into the new era of biotechnological research in India. <laughs>